I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about what I would read from our sacred text in order to further venture into this conversation around vive la différence, uh, which I think the other flip side is the pain of the difference as well. It can go both ways. And so often the human race has operated out of the pain of the difference, right? It was something to be chastised. It was a reason for separation. It was a reason to be threatened. It was a reason to put up walls, etc. Um, so the passage I chose to read is um, from our Judaic Christian family tree. Uh, maybe I give you a bit of a backstory, right? Okay, so of the patriarchs, the mythological patriarchs, in some ways, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So you recall that Isaac and Rebecca. Right, okay, so you have Abraham and Sarah, you have Isaac and Rebecca, and they had twins, right? Jacob and Esau, and within the story, there is a suggestion that even within the womb, Jacob and Esau were at war. I don't know if you remember that part of the story. Um, so they kind of come out, and Esau is the big brawly one who wants to be out there killing things, uh, roasting it over a spit, etc., etc., always out in the rugged one. And Jacob would have been known, and don't get me wrong, I would never use this ex expression, it is totally politically incorrect, but it is true that within the biblical account, he would be known as the mama's boy. All right? So right away, you have this different visions of just what it means to be human. But who came out of the womb first? Esau. And within a patriarchic society, that means it doesn't matter if Jacob was two seconds later, Esau rules, all right? Which means in that era, and up until about a century ago, less than that, because I have my own historic, my own 20th century story of how that worked out within my mother's family, Esau gets all of the possessions. All. All of the land, if his dad owns the country, gets the country and the sheep and the goats and the wives and et cetera, et cetera, right? So Rebecca. Her favorite was Isaac. And she didn't want Esau to get all of those possessions. She didn't want him to have his birthright. She wanted it to go to Jacob. And so what she did is Esau came home one day from the hunt. and Oh, he was so hungry. Um, and his, he was so hungry. And his, I think the story is his brother Jacob, who's at home in the kitchen with the women making soup, uh, says, look, I have this great bowl of soup for you, and I will give it to you if you give your firstborn blessing to me. Oh, he was just so ravishing. So he goes, oh, well, if you, listen, if you don't give me the bowl of soup, I'm going to die anyway, so you may as well have the blessing of the firstborn. And by the next day, he knew he had been tricked. And with the help of his mother, Rebecca, I, uh, Jacob gets out of town. All right? So here we are a number of years later, and there is about to be a reunion. And I think I want you to hear in this story, like this is the human story, right? This, is, this, is a, this story can be translated into our own lives, the lives of our neighbors, our country, these two provinces and around the world. It is the human challenge. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau, instructing them, give this message to Esau from me. I have lived with Laban as a refugee and stayed until now. That's his father-in-law. And I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves. And I have... Uh, the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. <sighs> Jacob was afraid. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies, thinking, Hmm, if Esau comes to one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. And... I'll get out too. And Jacob said, God, you told me to return to my country and to my kindred. And you said that if I did this, you would bless this action. I am not worthy of your faithfulness. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan. And now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother Esau. Because I am afraid of him and he may come and kill us all. Yet you have said that you would bless me with offspring as many as the sand of the sea. So he spent the night there and had his servants take Esau a present of hundreds of animals. He said to them, when Esau meets you, 
and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Tell him. They belong to your servant Jacob, and he is behind us. For he thought, if I give him a large gift, perhaps he will accept me. So this huge present passed on ahead of him, and he spent that night in the camp. He was left alone. And in his dream showed up a man who wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not win, he struck Jacob on this hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then the man said, let me go. But Jacob said, I will not. I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and struggled with humans and have prevailed. I moved from the flattest province in Saskatchewan to the Belle Provence in 1986 to take up theological studies at McGill. I had no idea what was ahead of me, but I can tell you that fall when the students at the college went down to the eastern townships for a retreat and I saw my first red maple leaf, I couldn't have imagined anything more beautiful. And I was almost like that. I don't know if you remember that part of the book, Heidi, where she goes down the mountain to live, I think, with her cousin, where there's actually white bread and not brown bread. And she's just so enamored with this white bread. It's so much more tasty and soft and fluffy than the brown bread that her grandfather makes that she starts hiding them away, thinking, I've got to just put them in a bag so I'll have them to take back up to my grandfather's. And that's how I felt around the autumn leaves in Quebec. I just kept collecting them, not realizing, of course, that they'd all return next year. It was interesting. One of the reasons I chose to go to Quebec is because in my undergrad, I'd done political science and languages, thinking I'd like to be part of the foreign service or a politician or something like that. Um, yeah. And uh, so I thought, you know what? We had three colleges. I think I'm going to try that college in Montreal. I get to speak my French. Right? I had a zillion years of studying French. And then I get to downtown Montreal. And does anyone want to speak French to me? No. And if I open my mouth and my accent is just a little bit off, they kind of look at me and they speak English back. In actual fact, in Montreal, I ended up speaking more Spanish than French because I got involved in the refugee community through the work of our denomination there. People back in Saskatchewan or in Ontario would say, well, you, you must speak French. Your congregation must be French. I said, no, English. And you can get through a day and a week and a month without having to speak any other language but English because that's, not, that's Montreal. It's not the hinterland of Quebec. And then I remember going back in summer holidays and watching the news as it was presented by the West about the whole language conversation. And having people say to me, Lynn, they're, they're fascists out there. Like, they, they won't let you put a sign up in English. And it's really interesting, like I say, seeing the story from that place in the West and going, yeah, it looks pretty bad back there. The way it's presented, the way they tell the story. Yet, in fact, I couldn't wait to get back to Quebec because there was something alive in that diversity, in that European flavor. I remember at one point being in Quebec City and thinking that if everyone from the West could just stand on these cobblestone streets and look up at this architecture so reminiscent of ancient Europe, that they would get it. They would get that ancient yearning to maintain a culture that could so easily be swallowed up in the sea of Anglo-North America. Interesting how they managed to have big conversations in Quebec. I, I guess we have them elsewhere, but they seem to be writ large in Quebec. For example, Phil and I met because of the Mohawk crisis. I moved into Chateauguay, uh, January of 1990. My little manse 
was two blocks from the barricade. All right, so the barricade was up, and the corridor that took mm, 20,000, well, well, we are in a community of 40,000 people, over through Ganawaki Reserve, over the St. Lawrence into Montreal, was blocked. All right? And the Mohawks, in solidarity with those who had started the conflict in Oka, um, drilled a, 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 a trough across this four-lane highway, and there was the barricade. And every night, particularly English people, would gather burning effigies sometimes with an incredible amount of anger. Um, and that was the time, and so I had a United Church colleague in the valley who knew Phil, who was a journalist. This is my ex-husband, for some of you who don't know, who is behind all of these photos. And who said they both wanted to come up and see that barricade. And there that was, two blocks from my house. Um, and I don't think there has been, and I remember thinking to myself, there has never been a situation in this country where finally uh, the voice of the indigenous people is being heard, and in fact people are standing up and listening to it. Um, there was a lot of anger that summer, but anger due to hundreds of years of injustice, but a big, big conversation right there in our midst. Um, the other big conversation was this one, and having been married to a photojournalist who insisted that I find myself in the Palais de Congress the night of the 1995 referendum. And I don't know if you remember that referendum, but um, I was in the Palais de Congress, which is like a, what is the Palais de Congress? It's like a convention hall. Yes, a convention hall. And I remember kind of trying to make myself as small as possible because I was pretty sure I was the only real Anglophone in the whole building. And tensions were running high. And I was feeling nervous. Isn't that interesting that I was really, really nervous to be there? Um, and I was in the hall and watching the numbers when the separation vote was at 53%. And it looked like that would be the end of Canada as we knew it. Where else does that happen in the world, let me ask you? And then hanging out under duress for about an hour and seeing the numbers move until I think, what did, what did the, it was like 0.5%. And also being in the hall when Jacques Parizeau took the, the podium and with a great deal of anger expressed the agony of a people who were just longing for autonomy and an opportunity to really, really solidify um, their culture, their language, their history. Boy, la belle province, where can you have conversations but there? And it seems like because of the Quebec spirit, those conversations are so much more in your face than they are in Ontario. Like, Ontarians don't get in your face, do they? Quite like that. I moved here from Quebec in 2010. And I don't know why I thought, because I've never lived in Ontario before. I don't know why I thought, oh, I mean, it's just, just about four hours down the road. How different can it be? Can't be that different, right? And then I get here. And then I miss my mountains. And I miss my diversity. And I miss my French neighbors. And I miss that community in the Shadgi Valley, which was deeply Scottish and deeply Irish and deeply French and deeply American, yet somehow managed to live in a community. Uh, wow, I missed it. And I came to Ontario and I came to Prince Edward County and I went, wow, everybody's kind of the same here. The big Canadian question, which is in play throughout the country, was just a little bit closer in Quebec. And here's the question. Can we hold it together? Not just two nations or three nations, but now hundreds of nations. Can we 
push through the pain and the fear and the anxiety and the nervousness and compromise? Can we reach consensus without breaking apart? Well, so far, yes. But we're by no means done. The story of Canada, the Canadian adventure is the human story on this piece of geography that is home to acres of snow, land of the midnight sun, the breadbasket of the world, the rock, the Belle Provence, Mohawk, Algonquin, Denny, Ukrainians, Mennonites. It's truly, as John Ralston Saul points out, a Métis nation. Canada represents the ancient challenge illustrated in our own sacred text, the challenge to work it out as brothers, as friends, as neighbors, as enemies. The challenge to face one another in our most basic humanity and recognize and take the chance that we may be better together. And our task then is to constantly, constantly, constantly let go of all those things that would insist on driving a wedge between us. This is not a Pollyanna vision. Nothing Pollyanna about the story I read from um, our own history book. It is a vision that requires an enormous struggle, particularly with our own unique demons. And like Jacob, you never survive a struggle like that unscathed. With the blessing of a new community also comes the injury. I invite you now during this time for contemplation when we will hear Micheline sing a, a Celine Dion song. I, in Coulomb, I've written the, uh, some of the translation in the bulletin. Um, I invite you to consider where this struggle is still required in your life. What is it within you that needs to be released in order to foster a greater communion with the world around you in order to get you beyond the pain of the difference to the place where there is gratitude and growing as well?